It's a great time to be talking about the Fed, right? It's all in the news. Um, hitherto, I mean, most of the time, all we know about the Fed is it's, you know, it's the name on the bill. It says Federal Reserve Note. And uh, otherwise, we're actually not supposed to be too interested in it. Uh, I think that's deliberate. It's supposed to be very mysterious, very uh, complicated. Um, this is something other people are handling. We're not supposed to be interested in it. On the other hand, it's, um, I would argue, an extremely interesting subject because we're being ripped off. I mean, it's a giant rip-off operation. And the key reason that the Federal Reserve, which is this uh, federal agency in Washington, um, its headquarters in Washington, it has subsidiary banks in different cities. There's one in Atlanta, uh, Cleveland, um, New York primarily, uh, all other places across the country. Uh, but why it's an immoral operation is it's essentially a giant counterfeiting machine. Now, we know if a, a private crook has got a counterfeiting machine, these days, of course, it's not a printing press. I guess it would be a, it'd be a color, uh, color um, copying machine is the way they do it. And if somebody's copying $20 bills and spending those, uh, we all know it's a, it's a crime. Why is it a crime? Because it's diluting the value of other people's $20 bills and making them worth less. So what the private counterfeiter does uh, on a very small retail basis, the Federal Reserve does on a huge international basis with far more damage. So one of the things that happens with the Federal Reserve, by the way, this is not an institution that has existed uh, all during American history. It was founded in 1913. Uh, signed into law by Woodrow Wilson, although supported by uh, President Taft before him. Um, it was, uh, the legislation was drawn up at, at Jekyll Island, Georgia, not that far from here at the private club of J.P. Morgan, and we're hearing again the name J.P. Morgan these days. He was the major banker of that era, along with uh, John D. Rockefeller Jr. and other representatives of the big banks. And they wrote up this, they wrote up the Federal Reserve Act, and they, the propaganda was that if only we would adopt the Federal Reserve Act, it would prevent the big bankers from doing damage to average Americans. Of course, it was, it was written by the big bankers uh, in order to enrich themselves and enrich their partner, the government. Uh, so the Federal Reserve immediately does, started doing what it was founded to do, that is inflate, uh, printing up money, literally printing up notes and also expanding uh, uh, bank balances. Um, and operating through the, the uh, uh, either buying or selling uh, federal treasury notes in order to um, enable the government to do all kinds of spending it would not be otherwise able to do if it simply had to tax or to borrow. So the first big inflation took place to fund World War I. There was an artificial boom similar to what we've experienced since 9-11, then the inevitable bust, but thank goodness we had a president uh, when the bus came in 1920 and 21, Warren G. Harding, one of my favorite presidents. He's one of the most hated and dissed presidents because he did nothing. When this, when this uh, uh, bus took place, there was a very sharp depression. Um, the federal government did nothing. And if you were to look at it on a chart, it just goes like this, whoosh, whoosh, and it's back up very quickly. We got over it quickly. Then the Federal Reserve inflated all during the 1920s. It uh, didn't show up so much in, the, in general prices, although prices stayed stable, which is all, actually always a dangerous sign because in a free market economy, given the vast increase in production that the capitalism provides, and without a money supply that's being artificially increased, prices tend to gently decrease. So when prices are not decreasing, you already know you've got trouble. But there was a big stock market boom. There was a... Uh, Florida land boom, there were other kinds of booms that took place in the 1920s. And then again, the bust followed. Unfortunately, the president at that time was Herbert Hoover, followed by Franklin Roosevelt, who did almost like they had a, uh, a plan. How can we do everything wrong? How can we do everything that will make sure that instead of being a short, sharp downturn and then a chance for, for uh, restored growth and real prosperity, Let's do everything we can to lengthen and deepen this and turn it into what became, of course, the Great Depression. It was um, at least 16 years before we were out of the Great Depression. It was not until after World War II that uh, the prosperity of 1929 uh, began to be recovered. Probably it was late, probably not until 1946 and 47 even. So this was a horrendous long period of time. 
uh, 25% unemployment for some of it. Um, of course, a horrible war. I mean, a lot of other, a lot of other things took place during those years. Uh, but the t- two of the things that both Herbert Hoover and Franklin Roosevelt attempted to do was to hold up prices, to keep prices from falling, uh, and to bail out failing industries. Similar to was exactly what's going on going on today. Uh, so because they refused to allow prices to fall, including prices of labor, there was a vast in, in the depression there was a vast deflation. Money became more valuable. So everything should cost less, and that's going to be a situation, including wages, because money bought more. But the federal government did everything possible to keep wages high, this, thus leading to, again, a 25% unemployment rate, a horrific, horrific unemployment rate. Uh, bailed out failing industries, uh, keeping businesses that should go out of business and allowing that, those, the capital and, and labor resources to be used in productive ways. They kept, um, to keep a losing business in, in uh, in operation, artificial like that, is, is, is destruction of wealth. It doesn't actually help the economy. It hurts the economy, although some people, of course, the owners of that particular firm, are very happy to be bailed out. Um, so it took, um, again, a very long time to get out of that. We had other booms and busts. Uh, since then, we had a bad time in the 1970s after President uh, Richard Nixon cut the final tie between the dollar and gold. Uh, Ron Paul talks about how this was the one event that got him into into politics on August 15, 1971, when Nixon um, said that from now on, he didn't put it in these terms, from now on the Federal Reserve can print however much money it wants, can create however, however much money, there will be no limitation on it. Before that, there had been some limitation because uh, there was a partial gold standard. Um, he also put price and wage controls on. Um, because he said because uh, prices were going up too high. Well, when you put, this is a separate subject, but when you put price and wage controls on, you artificially hold down uh, prices and wages that should be going up because at the same time, this is why governments pull that sort of a trick, they're vastly uh, increasing inflation. And indeed, that's what Richard Nixon did in the 1970s. And we had we had a, a bad recession. We had double-digit interest rates, double-digit price increases, very, very bad time that only ended when uh, Paul Volcker, uh, who was the chairman of the Fed in uh, 1980, 79 and 80, and subsequently um, stopped the inflation. That, again, was a recession, uh, but we got over it relatively, relatively easily. There was another huge monetary influx, thanks to the Federal Reserve, after 9-11. Uh, the Bush administration, um, I guess like any politicians, were terrified of a falling stock market. And so in order to prevent a falling stock, mo- stock market, they turned on the fire hydrant. I mean, the Fed always inflates at one rate or another. But starting after 9-11, just a vast output of new money and... Uh, one of the things, Ludwig von Mises explained this uh, in 1912 in his theory of money and credit, F.A. Hayek, Murray Rothbard, uh, and others uh, building on this, that when, the, when a central bank like the Federal Reserve increases the money supply that way, it decreases the value, just like a counterfeiting operation, of all the other dollars in, in existence. But it also does something else that's even worse than that. Uh, and I mentioned one of the things it does, it results in a redistribution of wealth so that when the people who get the new money, the newly printed, the newly created money first, the government, big bankers, uh, military industrial complex, government contractors in general and so forth, are able to spend that money before it loses value. And uh, other people in society, poor people, retired people, uh, rural people is even an interesting difference there, uh, who get the money last, um, uh, it's where after it's already lost its value. Um, so there's, a, in effect, a transfer of wealth from sort of the poorest and most vulnerable uh, sections of society to the richest and most powerful in cahoots with the government, another, another reason the Fed is immoral. But the worst thing that w- when the Federal Reserve does uh, this sort of fire hydrant operation uh, with new money is it creates the business cycle. Basically what happens is it holds down the interest rates that businessmen uh, borrow uh, for new projects below the market rate. We saw this, you know, since 9/11. Very, very low interest rates. We saw it in housing mortgages. Uh, people could get it in construction loans. 
uh, in all sorts of in all sorts of business loans. What this leads to is people making mistakes. They buy houses that really are more than they can afford. They undertake construction projects that look like a great idea at the time. All the condominium buildings in Las Vegas or in Miami or in California that look like just sure profits. People are going to be clamoring to move in. But when the bust comes, it turns out these were very, very bad ideas. Um, and an interesting point of this is the economic damage is done during the boom, not during the bust. It's during the boom when these bad decisions are made, and then they're cleaned up during the bust. So once the Federal Reserve has turned on the money hydrant and uh, put out this vast amount of money through the banking system, that's when the damage is done. So the damage has been done. Then your choices are either let a sharp, short correction take place that you can then build for the future, or to take the Hoover-Roosevelt Road and try to prevent that from happening and therefore make the recession into a long-lasting depression. Uh, so right now, this is the situation we're in, and uh, the Democrats and Republicans seem uh, to be dedicated to the idea of not allowing prices to fall, keeping pri housing prices up, keeping failing industries in existence, whether it's um, J.P. Morgan, uh, Morgan Stanley your company, whether it's uh, Goldman Sachs, whether it's General Motors, Chrysler, Ford, they're all, they're all wanting to get in on the act and be bailed out. By the way, it looks like they're bailing out everybody but you, just to let you know that they're not taking over your bad debts and paying them. But uh, all the powerful people connected with the government, they are, they are indeed doing that. So this is, it's a very scary situation right now. Um, who knows what they're going to do? Um, Ron Paul, I was talking to him this morning, and he said he'd, he'd gone to a dinner meeting of all the Republican members of the House Banking Committee. And he said for the first time, they were all saying, hey, what's happening? You know, what is this one? He said, normally they're not. They know everything and they're not asking him. But he said the one thing that struck him was that they're all terrified. Um, they're all terrified in Washington. They're terrified about, not about you, not about your living standard, not about your family, not about your savings, not about your job. Terrified, of course, about their own power and, and their own jobs. Because this is a very destabilizing situation for the government when it causes this kind of economic train wreck. So what are they doing? Are they letting the short, sharp correction take place? Or are they, again, they're doing the Hoover-Roosevelt thing. They're trying to keep up housing prices. They're bailing out failing industries to keep a, uh, um, a Goldman Sachs in business when it should go out of business. Is a, it's a ripoff of the average person. It's a reward to the very wealthy guys who own the firm. Um, and it's the destruction of wealth, wealth that ought to be being used in a, a much more effective and productive manner than by the losers who uh, set up these companies and benefited so much from the boom and now want to be saved in uh, the sort of socialism for the rich that the federal government specializes in and, of course, the Federal Reserve specializes in. So here the – so in one, in one aspect, I would say this looks – it looks bleak. It looks uh, – um, like they're going to really do more damage to us. It looks like we're all going to be poorer. Uh, inflation is already running by any honest measure at double digits. Any of us who visit a supermarket know that's the case. These, this talk about 3, 4, 5% inflation is ridiculous. It's much higher than that. Maybe it's going to go to what it did in the Nixon administration. Maybe we're going to see 18, 19, 20% price increases. That's making us all poorer because our money buys, buys less and less and has many other bad effects, too. Uh, so that's, that's not good. Will they actually make this a very, very long and deep recession? Um, it's possible. On the, on the bright side of things, and I, I think there always is a bright side, um, I mentioned this is a very destabilizing thing for the government. Um, here they have held themselves out as the... They talk about the people on Wall Street pretending to be masters of the universe. In Washington, D.C., they think they're masters of the universe. They think they can do anything. They think they can wave, wave the magic money wand and cure any problem. Um, but it's not true. And I think that one of the reasons they're terrified is they've always thought the Federal Reserve could always take care of anything. By monetary depreciation, by the destruction of the dollar, and by bailing out people, it could always fix things, paper over the problem, uh, keep things going, and uh, they'd all still 
be enjoying their jobs and their power in Washington. This time they're worried. Um, it may not be. It may be that the Fed can't do it. It may be that this vast bailout, and probably it's more, we're talking much more than seven hundred billion dollars. We're talking undoubtedly over a trillion dollars. That we're looking at probably the first trillion dollar federal budget deficit in effect. Um, so the effects of this are very, very bad, even aside from, from, from our own lives. Um, it probably means, at least potentially means, the end of the dollar as the world reserve currency, uh, which is a, a major prop of the, the federal government's activities all over the world, make, make those much more difficult. But it also, it also um, undermines legitimacy. Governments are always very concerned about legitimacy, uh, making people feel that they you know, should obey them. Uh, anything that undermines that legitimacy, they they uh, very much dislike. So the fact that they're all scrambling around, uh, as Tom uh, Woods mentioned, so you know, seven percent of the American people uh, endorse this bailout, and ninety-three percent of us think it's a terrible idea, and and rightly so. So here they're about to do something that virtually everybody thinks is a ripoff, and they're right, it is a ripoff. Uh, something that also is not going to work even by their own standards. Um, so they're being undermined. Uh, they're very worried. It may make it difficult f- for them to do exactly what they want to do. It certainly is going to make it impossible for them to do what they think they're going to do in terms of fixing everything. Um, so I guess we've got interesting times ahead. In some sense, Wall Street has, has uh, seized the Treasury Secretary's office. So under this new, this new bailout bill, the Treasury Secretary, who is a representative of Wall Street, Henry Paulson, former uh, CEO of Goldman Sachs, uh, now using taxpayer money to bail out with many billions of dollars his former and probably future employer. Uh, I don't know how many. He used to own $500 million of Goldman Sachs stock. I don't, does he still? I'm, I don't know, but uh, I'm suspicious. Uh, so here he is making, enriching himself, enriching his pals, um, and not being able to be questioned by any court. Uh, in this bill, nothing the Treasury Secretary does in terms of bailouts can be questioned by any court under any circumstances. And it even gives him power, in a sense, independent of the president. So it's, in effect, uh, Wall Street um, taking over permanently, I guess, the office of the Secretary of the Treasury. Barack Obama said if he were elected president, he would want to keep Henry Paulson on, either as Treasury Secretary or as uh, some sort of uh, overseer to continue the, the bailout into his administration. Um, Barack Obama's biggest donors were from Wall Street. John McCain's biggest donors were from Wall Street. So he sort of got Wall Street candidate A and Wall Street candidate B. Um, but I think that I th- my, my guess is that um, their power is going to be uh, massively undermined, even though they think they're increasing their power. I think that it's actually going to be undermined. And I think if the, another there's just a slight crack in the climate of opinion, but, which for so long has been the Federal Reserve can do no wrong, Federal Reserve is wonderful. Federal Reserve is necessary to civilize life and all the rest of the things that are either explicitly or implicitly taught to us. Federal Reserve is now being undermined in people's minds. Uh, it's also in, engaging in a seizure of regulatory power. They want to take over other regulatory agencies, centralize all regulatory power within the central bank. Um, it's a uh, alarming thing. It's maybe another thing like the, the uh, Great Society or the New Deal or what Nixon did with uh, ending the gold standard. Uh, it's, a, it's a tremendously interesting period of history to be living in. Uh, but I don't think all the news is bad. I think because they can't do what they want to do. Uh, no politician wants to believe there's such a thing as economic law. They all think they should be King Canute and be able to order the tide not to come in. But they can't do it. Uh, there are economic laws. Um, if A, then B. Certain things follow from certain things they do. They think that by just using the power of the gun or the power of the printing press, they can prevent bad consequences from happening, including bad consequences for themselves, but, but they can't. So this is a, is a revolutionary moment. People in this country are, I think, for the first time, open to hearing about the Fed, about the Treasury, about what's wrong with the whole financial system, which is also based on uh, banks that are inherently bankrupt because of fractional reserves. Uh, your money's not in the bank. If a significant number of customers go to a bank to try to get their money out, the bank has to close its doors unless it's bailed out by the federal government. So the whole system is very, very shaky. Um, it's revolutionary. Maybe everything is going to go for the worst. 
Uh, I tend to think that's not going to be the case, um, although they are the fact that it's absolutely true that we're all going to be poorer. Maybe not some of the people on Wall Street. They'll do very well. Uh, but average Americans are going to be poorer. I think we need to know who to blame in this situation. And uh, the, the villain right at the top of the list is the central bank of the United States, the Federal Reserve, now headed by Ben Bernanke, previously headed by Alan Greenspan. And their most recent um, crimes, uh, the vast monetary inflation that they uh, undertook in response to 9-11. Uh, thank you very much.